Welcome to this, this uh, afternoon panel here at GraphConnect. Um, one of the amazing things that has, that has blown me away about graph databases in Neo4j in the past, say, 12 to 18 months uh, is the disproportionate amount of uptake that graph databases has versus a lot of other technologies, in particular databases, uh, amongst the global 2000. So amongst really big companies. Uh, there's a bunch of huge companies out there using graph databases for really mission critical things, which blows me away. away. We, uh, about a year ago, we had a, a handful of Global 2000. Now we have over 20 Global 2000 using just Neo4j specifically, um, which is pretty extraordinary. Here we have a fine, uh, uh, young and awesome uh, little uh, collection of people who are from some of these Global 2000. Uh, so we have Sebastian Verhoege, Ish. Uh, from Telenor in Norway. Uh, actually, I'm supposed to be able to pronounce your name. I apologize. Um, and then we have Dominic Wagenknecht. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> from, from Accenture. And we have Priyam Malhotra from, from Cisco, all under the amazing guidance of Matt Aslett from the 451 group. So Matt, take it away. Thank you, Noel. Thanks for uh, handling the pronunciation, Dave. I'm not looking forward <laughs> yeah. to that. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, thank you, everybody, for, for joining uh, this session. So I'm, my name is Matt Aslett. I'm Research Manager for Data Management and Analytics at 451 Research, and um, I presented uh, earlier, you know, our perspective on a, the graph database adoption and some of the trends uh, in the industry. And anyone who was in that session would, would know we had, you know, some some interesting questions at the end, specifically related to, you know, customer adoption trends and specifically some of the the, the potential issues that that can happen at customer uh, customer adoption and deployments. And um, I was helpfully able to bat some of those questions away and, and tell you to come to this. Uh, panel where hopefully uh, those will be answered. Uh, as Emil says, you know, three very interesting uh, projects. Um, I think rather than you know jump between the three, we'll start off, you know, uh, speaking to, to each one about the project in detail, and then we can go into more sort of general questions. And then at that point, perhaps once we've heard everybody speak, open it up uh, for for more questions as well. So um, for start. Uh, with Prem, since you're sitting uh, right next to me. In terms of um, the, the project that you're involved with, um, could you just tell us you know, a little bit more about the company, which I think people will know, but um, specifically your role within that company, and perhaps a little bit about, about the background, your background, and, and how you got involved in this. Sure. So uh, my name is uh, Prem Malhotra. Uh, I work for uh, Cisco Systems. And uh, probably all of you know it's one of the large uh, telecom uh, collaboration space and uh, uh, data center space company. And what I do there is um, I work for the IT, and our job is to um, enable the business uh, to run, run their systems faster and uh, with um, agility. And I work for a master data management space. So over the last five years, uh, we have evolved the master data to be at par with the, the best uh, uh, practitioners in the um, in the size of the companies that we are we, we work with, like uh, Intel and Microsoft and so on. And the work that I'm going to describe to you is part of that MDM suite. So can I have the slides, please? I have a few slides to kind of go over, so it kind of gives you a good sense of it. And I can probably stand here here to talk about it. So uh, the, the th there are three components of the MDM space. Uh, one is uh, the customer MDM, which is all the information about customer hierarchies, customer attributes, and so on. And uh, the, what we have is a, a transactional MDM, which means it's not after the fact, it is while uh, an application requires uh, a customer data, it kind of fetches it using the real-time um, calls. And if the new data needs to be created, it kind of gets done right on the fly. The other second part of MDM is um, the item uh, information, which is all the products and services that Cisco sells. And again, uh, a lot of attributes that go with it, which are attributes required for managing different business operations that happen along the Cisco's commerce platform. Now, these two were the beginning ones that, uh, that are all based on the Oracle technologies which we have enhanced, so no new, new uh, 4J there. 
So the good question would be why, do, why does the Oracle shop like Cisco go for a graph database out of nowhere? So the re reason for that is the complexity of problem that uh, a classic uh, relational database has a hard time solving. And that's where the third one comes. And the third piece is uh, in the domain called hierarchy management. So it's called hierarchy management platform. And uh, the business problem that it addresses is that uh, you have a bunch of hierarchies across uh, finance systems, across, across uh, the Cisco's uh, businesses, which uh, the way Cisco evolved so fast that they all kept in silos. So you often find hierarchies which look very similar. All they have differences is they have got different attributes or their few nodes are different. Now the challenge is that each silo does do, do a good um, governance of its own information, but they're not talking to each other. So there's a lot of spreadsheet work going on when you have to connect or map different hierarchies together. So that uh, slows down the business and above all, there is no single source of truth. The core MDM principle is that you have a single source of truth that everybody, every application, every system is, is able to consume. That does not happen with these hierarchies. So though a customer and item domains did keep a lot of key hierarchies there which are all managed and available to everyone, the rest of the ecosystem did not have that capability. So what we looked at, some of the problems that uh, happen when this, uh, this occurs. Uh, one, one problem is uh, when you have to uh, allocate uh, in the finance, you have to allocate the revenue allocations for different business groups to different product families. Now, these allocations keep on changing year to year or every six months. And what uh, finance does is, as a business, is a uh, lot of spreadsheets keep going around. You can't go back in time. So time variance was a big thing. So if you all heard uh, Rebecca's talk, there were two things that uh, connect to what I'm, uh, I'm going to tell you. One was uh, the temporal aspect of data is very important for a big business. That there was no way to do, keep it. Second was there is a product hierarchy with product families and so on. And then there is this whole hierarchy about how Cisco is organized into business units. Business units have sub-business groups. And these also keep morphing over a period of six months, one year, and so on. And the companies that we acquire. And mapping the product families in terms of what a re a revenue they need to bring in uh, for each of these groups is a problem that was connecting two hierarchies together. There's no way to do it, uh, except on spreadsheets. So that, that problem basically slows down how fast can business uh, in, in finance can do modeling of how to allocate uh, different uh, revenues for both internal reporting and for external reporting. Even uh, that part is different. And being able to uh, publish it to all downstream systems. So uh, second problem that happens uh, is um, in a large company like Cisco, you have HR hierarchy, which is all the people reporting to managers, da da da, and then you have uh, projects which are uh, funded by a department hierarchy. I think the slides are still not there, but I can just talk to them. So um, what happens there is uh, I, I get a I get to fund a project, uh, but it is run by somebody else. Who had, uh, so the team reports to another uh, um, group. I have no visibility into uh, the people who are working on that group and so on. So can you, um, can you go up to the next slide? Yeah, OK. So this, uh, this is the kind of a, uh, picture that shows uh, multiple problems. I just talked about one of them, which was a mapping of the hierarchies. But uh, uh, look at the bottom right. That's the one I'm talking about right now, where there's a need to map the uh, HR hierarchy with the uh, funding hierarchy, which is uh, uh, the finance department's hierarchy, because either one of them need to know about the each other, and that that uh, the lack of that connection causes again slow down a lot of emails exchange and on and on. Uh, the last one I, I just want to talk about on the top right, Cisco has grown over time by assimilating a lot of companies. You bring in a company which is a moderate size, mid size company. They have different uh, product families, they have different subgroups. Now. Getting the hierarchies into your native hierarchy takes a much longer time than being able to say, can I map them together? Again, it's a hierarchy mapping problem, which, which needs, to, needs to happen. So next slide, please. Next. Yeah. So why, why did we pick Neo4j? Um, there was a, uh, the hierarchies, when you connect them, become well-connected graphs. And uh, so the graph database had a natural semantic fit to that, that kind of problem representation. Uh, next to the time variance I talked about, 
and then the sandbox capability that you want to be able to um, say what if analysis, what if I connected these, these two hierarchies in a different way, what is the outcome of that in terms of my reporting and data warehouse and so on. That means again a system that uh, can not only see the past because when you're going to do some changes you've got to see whether this change was tried out in the past or not. So there's a time variance and being able to try out uh, what you did in the past to something you want to do in the future. And then the approvals and all the stuff that goes with it is, uh, is also part of the system. So, and then the business rules that go with it, uh, you've got to be able to validate each of those rules, whether you do it with a graph kind of a system, using Cypher, that's what we're trying to do right now, or some other means. So the real uh, piece of or this is that at the end of the day, this all has to be real time. Your business analysts and business managers don't want to kind of wait for the next day, next day to, for the computation to happen. Now, Neo fitted the bill as a part of a system. So what we have is a system built where Neo is one of the components, the, the heart of it, plus so many other things, uh, which are, uh, think of it as assembled in Cisco model for using open source components. So next slide, please. So this is kind of a general uh, sense of it. I just kind of just want to flash it and then skip through it. Basically what it does is uh, the governance and single source of truth uh, capability, one, one stop shop for getting all the hierarchies, being able to model and so on. Um, Go to the next one, please. So these are different open source components that are used. So the bottom you see the hierarchy engine, then uh, we are right now using a rules, which is open source rules based system, but eventually it get replaced by Cypher, because when this work started, there was no Cypher um, behavior in the, in the product. There's the open workflow, open symphony, and then there's uh, uh, Cytoscape is a, uh, is a uh, visualization tool used in the molecular uh, biology sp uh, space. We ad uh, adopted it uh, for uh, being able to visualize the hierarchies that uh, this HMP system uh, depicts. And then there's an the internal Cisco software called CEPM, which is a role-based access uh, that is very, very important for this kind of a system that runs uh, 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 mission important uh, information. So go to the next slide, please. So I, here's the kind of example I wanted to show what we do with the new modeling for time variance. So what this shows here is um, the node or gay uh, has a bunch of versions hanging out there based on time. We have time uh, all the way to the second, though people don't do changes that fast. But you can go back to the old versions, the versions under N audit are some of the older versions. And uh, this is, what this causes is you have to got to keep lots of information, number of nodes and entities increase in very large numbers. And that this is where the SQL databases basically they, f they fall apart because of the joint and the speed uh, kills you. Like right now there's only one, hi one hierarchy in the, there are two hierarchies which are connected at this point of time and we already have 250,000 nodes and uh, links uh, in the system. And the f uh, forecast is in another uh, year and a half or two, there will be about three million entities. Uh, in the system. And then, so what you see here is uh, the org A and org C. Uh, org C has one, only one um, old time copy. Or org A has uh, three of these. And they are, uh, the way the APIs are built on top, they're all transparent. So you can go and make a query to say, I want um, uh, the hierarchy on this particular date. And it will, it will make sure the, it can, it can uh, pick the right nodes and the links for that particular date validity. So it has a, it will figure out the date overlap and all that stuff. So it looks simple here, but the amount of information you need to keep is uh, very significant there. And the traversals as well. Uh, go to the next slide, please. This is just to kind of show, along with the time variance, there's a state diagram that you need to keep uh, in place for the approval cycle. The, uh, you can do what if as well as a live system all in one. That means you have to have states for every, everything, both the nodes and the links from between different nodes. And uh, the draft pending and approval, approval cycle has to be captured and audited. So it has to be available to say who, who in the past made sure this particular um, hierarchy was uh, finally approved and uh, kind of stamped kind of thing. So the next slide, please. So this is uh, the hierarchy mapping that I had uh, verbally described before, that the top hierarchy is enterprise hierarchy, the bottom one is uh, uh, products and the product families um, uh, that you have, and in the middle is where the problem lies. There was no, till we put the system in place, there was no way to do a revenue allocation by linking different uh, nodes from one hierarchy to the other. And this information is not static, it changes. 
uh, over time and sometime uh, even kind of uh, time in the back because there is some, uh, some uh, process most uh, finance groups have called restatement which has even more complexity of the changes that they do for the mapping within the two hierarchies. So where the system is today, this is a general purpose hierarchy management platform. It's not just meant for these two, but it's going to bring in HR hierarchies in there. It's going to bring in some of the supply chain uh, forecasting hierarchies as well. And these are all um, uh, would be available as a single source of truth for all the remaining eco ecosystem. And I think I stop here. I've already talked enough. And let you guys <laughs> Yeah, I think you answered pretty much all the questions. Uh, but um, uh, one thing I did want to ask, I mean, obviously, you know, you found that graph databases was the solution for this problem. Um, had you, you know, have you tried to do it in any other technologies? You know, yeah, and yeah, how did you end question. up getting yeah. to that conclusion that it was a graph? Yeah, absolutely good question. I forgot about that part. <laughs> So uh, when we started looking at this problem, we, uh, we went out to shop for a system uh, because typically IT will not build something from scratch. So we went to Oracle, our standard vendor is Oracle, and they had a product called uh, DRM. DRM comes from their Hyperion acquisition. And uh, uh, when we looked at it, okay, so, so you, you want a demo of it, uh, fine, they give you a demo which is very small, you can make a hierarchy, you can, uh, you can kind of uh, uh, have a good uh, UI and all that. But uh, we wanted to give them, we gave them real data. See, here's my set of uh, um, uh, hierarchies that I want to be interlinked or connected together. And uh, the answer was, no, I can't demo it. It was the system was really a very Mickey Mouse kind of a kind of, kind of, kind of entity. It never meant, it did not have the capability to take the scale of what's score required. The next thing we went to, uh, I think there was a Cyperion has a product which is an MDM product which has hierarchy as a core uh, part of it. So they could do some of these things, but every time you want to change, they have to go back, spend, take a week, fine tune the tables and the tuning and all that that you do in a in a standard table based uh, system and come back and show you. So the question was, what is your operational cost you're going to incur every time you do that kind of change? Plus, this is a, a real-time system. So the users, business users, once they get it, they want to actually be the guys in control instead of it being an IT uh, in, in the loop. And th at that point, we saw the, uh, that there was a need to find out something else. And I don't know who, who came up with a new idea, but there was one of, one of my team member uh, basically uh, uh, said there was a graph option. So then we started exploring it. We, we ran some experiments with it, and it, uh, it, it stood the scaling aspect very well. So right now, our system actually runs on a three-node uh, high-availability cluster, um, and it is also uh, synchronizes well with the Cisco's policy of uh, running on the cloud with multiple data centers. So there are two data centers, active, active, and all that stuff is going on. And so that because of its, uh, uh, it being a newer, uh, kind of a system, it doesn't have the legacy of a, uh, older d databases where getting scalability is a, is, a, is a hard thing. It has a horizontal scalability built, in, built for it. Okay, thanks, Prem. Let's uh, perhaps, perhaps move on uh, to, to Dominic for now and then, and then come back uh, later on. But um, just if you could introduce yourself, the company you work for, and in particular, given the company you work for, the, the, the client that uh, you've been involved with. Um, yeah, I'm Dominic Wagenknecht from uh, Accenture, so uh, consulting and system integrator. Um, I've been with Accenture for more than five years and I'm a technology architect generally, so that just means it is my job to, whenever a client has a certain problem or brings out an RFP, it is my job to build together this uh, landscape of IT components and also reason about why it is a smart choice to go this way or the other. Um, where else? Um, I don't know who it is. <laughs> and uh, in in this regard, I'm I'm in uh, in NoSQL, so I'm uh, trying to move forward the NoSQL space because uh, also within Accenture we have seen that this is a future. Uh, thing and we see clients demanding solutions that require a level of flexibility that is hard to do uh, with a relational database. And so I presented earlier um, um, a case of a, a global logistics company where essentially uh, we brought the entire uh, 
logical logistic network into Neo4j, which gives uh, the client unparalleled flexibility. He can just move and, and change things. And there is this interesting point uh, you mentioned that uh, the, the functional people, so the people using the systems, they don't want to wait forever for the technical departments to get their things ready. And so we, we have stuff in there like uh, flexible additional fields and, and all those uh, comfort features, let's say, and uh, they are pretty easy to, to implement in a database like, like, for example, Neo4j. And it's just very lean and straightforward to make a new connection where there wasn't a connection before. Yeah, so, so that's what we're seeing. And yeah, and, and I mean, from what I understand a little bit about the, the project, it, it involved the company thinking sort of differently about its network and how it, yes. it moves uh, you know, things to be delivered through that network. So you know, how did that translate to the, the, you know, the technical solution that was delivered? Um, well, in the end, logistics, uh, and we see that in other cases as well. So we uh, we used Neo4j in a few other instances, but some materialized, some didn't. Um, that this uh, graph traversal is like the really key powerful thing. Yeah, I like to to use this this uh, corollary like uh, with your friends network. If you're traveling through a logistics network, or you personally are trying to get from A to B. Just imagine you're walking out there of the hotel and you want to go to Tokyo to some other hotel. So you, you will have quite a few hops, depending on uh, how your trade-off uh, money versus comfort of ride and so on is. You will pick up a taxi or you will even drive with a bus and you will make a few stops and then you will head over and so on and so forth. Uh, so that is a typical graph job, and it is perfectly solved with uh, graph traversals, whereas in a relational database you would have a pretty hard time because in general you would have like two tables. Uh, the one would say these are the nodes, which is the bus stop, the, uh, the, the, the airport, uh, and some random locations. And then you would have the connections, which is like planes, uh, buses, taxis, and, and whatsoever. And now to calculate the way you do like inner joining on this thing. So in this particular case, it makes absolute sense to go for a graph database. But I'm not saying that it's the cure of all problems. Sure. So we have multiple databases in the system. Yeah, yeah. And, and in terms of the, the, you know, the distribution company, I mean, it was the business problem they were trying to solve was about, about changing the, the way in which you know, those connections were made. Is exactly. So they, they wanted to be able to flexibly uh, make connections between areas that were traditionally organized in different uh, business entities and, and, and little kingdoms, like many uh, grown uh, companies. You have an old structure, and at a certain point of time, you want to break lines through that. And that is something that Neo4j in that case enables. Sure. And, and so did you, have you looked at other graph database technologies, or is it prim primarily Accenture working through, through Neo4j? Um, given, given, given the point of time uh, when we started that, um, we, we didn't really see a, a reasonable competitor at that point of time for exactly that kind of application. So, I mean, you have to do a trade. We are not big data, so we don't necessarily need stuff like Apache Giraffe or, or, or whatever. Uh, Java fits very well, so especially in the enterprise, I think running on Java is, is key. It's like, it's a very low entry barrier. It's also easy for the clients. All our clients use Java. It's, they just have it. They have deals with Oracle or IBM to, to, to have their Java EE server. They just know how to run those things. Sure. Yeah. Sure. And we did a proof of concept, of course. Sure. OK. Yeah. And in terms of now the, the project obviously up and running, what, what benefits have you seen, both sort of technical and, and from a business perspective in, with that particular client? Oh, that's very sh quick to answer. We are in the holiday high season, and the system is running. Right. So uh, there, is, there is no worse uh, time for any logistics company than upcoming Christmas. 
it's it's madness. Uh, you you can see that, for example, with Amazon. I mean, they they are getting in uh, temporary people by the thousands, but that automatically means that the entire global logistics system is pumping because you have to get that stuff to Amazon, you have to get it to clients, it has to get to the suppliers and so on. So essentially, running up to Christmas, everything is full. Yeah. Sure. So when you're running steady at that point of time, it is a sufficient ex achievement. Okay. <laughs> so I guess the big test, well, next few weeks still to come, but so far so good. Uh, so far, so good. Yeah, I mean, if we if we go till mid of December, it's then then more or less typically uh, the the statistics tell us that then the the wave goes down because the stocks are filled and uh, so the pipelines are running out. <laughs> okay, great, great. So Sebastian, uh, last no, by no means least, uh, please introduce yourself, the company you're with, and, and the particular sort of problem you've, you've addressed with Neo4j. Yeah. Uh, so my name is Sebastian Hugh. I work for uh, Telenor, Norway. So we're a telco operator in Norway, a uh, major telco operator in Norway, so like AT&T maybe in the US. Uh, but our market is uh, smaller, obviously. So we're in Norway, it's around 5 million people. So and we have a major share of them. Uh, I work for the, um, within the mobile department, so the mobile subscriptions. Um, yeah, so we, we actually had a problem then. Um, it was, uh, we have administrators of large companies who are customers of Telenor, and they have a lot of mobile subscriptions. So we have a self-service solution where they can enter and do changes to all the subscriptions, uh, look at the counting parts, everything, um, and because it's important, very important to maintain security. So when the administrator logs on, we need to address which resources within the company is he allowed to access. That's really, really important, as you understand. And previously, I mean, when, when we had like smaller companies and when the usage of mobile uh, subscriptions took off and they bought more and more, and the problem was that use, uh, calculating this, which resources you have access to within a relational database as we did took more and more time. And for our largest customers having maybe 100,000 subscriptions, uh, that took up to 20 minutes. Um, so the solution would be that during nighttime, we would log on for the user, calculate all the resources he had access to, and Lock. cache it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, <clears throat> and then, um, I mean, that was one thing. Uh, so the caching worked, but uh, you had stale data. And if you had a user, a new user, like create a new administrator for a company, it would still take for the large customers, like up to 20 minutes, for the new users to gain access to the resources and be able to log on during daytime. So, uh, I mean, that was the problem. and. It was basically, we need to find a way of doing this much, much faster. So we did a little investigation. Uh, we tried to look at different kind of technologies. Uh, we thought about doing like an in-memory version of the relational database. That was one option. Uh, we thought about using a graph database. Because the, the way that we give access to a user is for large companies, it's simplest. He's given access to a top node, and that top node being the legal entity of the company. And that company might consist of other legal entities like uh, companies that are owned by the parent companies. So we have a structure. Already you're seeing the structure, so you see where I'm going here. And within those companies, you have a lot of accounts for billing purposes. And other, all the, uh, below the accounts, obviously, <coughs> then you have uh, the subscriptions, all the subscriptions. So all of these resources are connected in a thread structure. And that's why somebody said, hey, look at the whiteboard. This looks like a graph. Maybe we should use a graph database. Um, and I mean, we, we, we didn't have time to evaluate a lot of different options. So uh, we did a little research around the market. 
which are the leading providers about uh, for graph databases. And we found Neo4j to be a good candidate. Uh, many people used it. So we said, okay, we start prototyping really early. So we started prototyping, and it seemed to be a good match. Uh, and then we made a decision that, okay, we, we could do this in-memory uh, relational database stuff, but what, what do we believe? In? We, we didn't have the, really the money to just and the time to try both solutions. So we said, okay, we, we believe in the graph database being the optimal option. So we just went for it from there. Yeah. Okay. And, and what are the results? I mean, so you said it was previously 20 minutes to, to run that. What, what <coughs> yeah, at? so I mean, it, it, um, the project, uh, so the resource authorization service that we now introduced using the graph database, uh, which replaced the old one being in stored procedures within a relational database, it took up to 20 minutes previously. And now when we do it within the graph database, we have, um, we have extracted a subset of the data within the relational database into the graph database. We have everything within heap. So in terms of heap, we're, we're about 15 gigabytes, the heap size we have, because we have shaved away everything else that's not like structure. So we only have the structured data within the graph database. And calculating now for the, I mean, the worst case now for calculating for big customers, so that's two seconds. So it's a huge, uh, huge uh, improvement. And even, I mean, uh, we don't even more like, it's not normally that we try to calculate all the resources. That's something we did previously because we cached it. Now we actually just check, do I have access to this resource, right? And doing that within the relation, no, in the graph database, that's two milliseconds. That's even faster. And that's like, you have one user, you have one resource within the entire, like all the users you have, like many million users, and. Uh, tens of millions of resources. Is there a connection between them? And we also have like business rules regarding you have to see if you have inheritance allowed for this resource because not all users have that. So we also have some logic you have to compute. And that's two milliseconds like for just picking two nodes in a graph database. Sure. So I'm just wondering like important thing is, are you solving a business problem or not? So business would hardly care whether you use uh, Neo or you use uh, Oracle or MySQL, but fundamentally, what offer can the IT give in terms of uh, the vision that these are the class of things that business can do differently? So, so can you guys maybe speak to what those um, demands sound like? I mean, like, what are the business goals? Like, how are they expressed when around these kinds of things? How is the value is kind of like presented to the technical team to execute? Speed of uh, how fast business can do things themselves. I think the biggest thing in most IT is uh, infamous for is IT takes time, IT takes money. Business says, no, I, 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 I'd rather have, give me something that I can use myself for changing whatever I'm doing uh, in, in the application. And I think we're going towards that direction. The more you, I have systems which are uh, which have lower cost of operation and the lower cost of change. Business is not static; it evolves continuously, and that that part IT has not really kept up the speed with. I think there. So the, it's not just the fact that you're trying to use Neo to solve all the problems. Neo is one one part of the answer. It is it has to be the whole set of application domain is has to think differently, and this is what we have started doing now. Sure. I think this this was a question that cropped up early in my presentation in terms of. You know, if you start trying to talk to the, the business, particularly if you're trying to get, you know, the, the funding for the project, and you start talking about graph databases, graph models, you know, they're probably going to quickly sort of the eyes glass over. So it sounds like the, the key thing is to pinpoint, if you can, the business benefit that will come from the graph database, graph models, and start to talk at that level, and, and you focus on the actual technical issues yourselves. In fact, most companies, the MDM initiatives fail. If you go, go to the Gartner uh, stats, it is almost like 60% plus fail. And the reason they fail, one of the reasons is that it is always pushed as an IT initiative. 
we did very different stuff with MDM. The other two that I described as well, and including hierarchy management, that uh, we took the business problems and we tied uh, business ROI to say, now if you do this uh, funding for this uh, MDM initiative and how it is uh, helping you really solve the real uh, end business uh, ROI, um, then the story is very different. Business wants to work with you, and the change management that goes with it is also uh, not an issue for business if there's a complete story to that. Sure, sure. Other uh, research analyst companies are available, <coughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think the, the key about managing your data is having a clear sense of who has the ownership. So wh which one is the master? In, in, in the case I presented, we replaced the master. So the, the old master is essentially now just updated daily uh, via a push. I Neo4j going more to the, to the, to the technical observation uh, pushing data into Neo4j, so if Neo4j is like the recipient and it is like the add-on system where you do your complicated graph things or your analytics or stuff like that, uh, you would simply run a batch insert. That one is pretty performant. Don't try a normal one. Um, getting data of Neo4j out in our experience is not a problem at all. So read performance on Neo is really good. We typically have the problem that the JDBC connection on the other side can't handle uh, the, the incoming load. So it's, it's pretty straightforward, although there is no support within Neo4j for uh, some kind of uh, batch execution or, or uh, ETL or something like that. That's all, that, yeah, you gotta do that yourself. I could just follow up that one, yeah. uh, because we had a little different approach there, so I think it's um, uh, worth noting. Um, I mean, we have a, uh, it's a legacy system. It's a 12-year-old uh, um, middleware system, uh, monolithical. And also, we have like one large relational database with everything. So there was no real option replacing uh, the uh, relational database with uh, a graph database. So just to tell quickly, I mean this, this is also a benefit, like we, we basically uh, from our relational database we have a feed of messages so and this feed is updating live the graph database. So we do that continuously. So if I do a do an update or insert within the relational database within milliseconds the graph database and the services are updated. So that's great. And also, I mean, uh, for our part, that was also essential in order to reduce risk. Because if we were to take a critical component of data mastering and replacing that with new technology, there would be a lot of risk. And um, the way, we, I mean, this way, we had this service, uh, which was then fed on replicated data, and we reduced a lot of risk just by doing that. And also, um, yeah, um, that being it simple way or a simple way to get acceptance within a established organization to use new technology. If you would try to resell or try to sell new technology and say we're going to replace, then it would be much it would be a much harder sale also. So I think it's a good approach in order to take advantage of new technology. <coughs> One of the things that, that I talked about earlier was you know if you look at the graph database landscape you, could, you one of the ways of of dividing that up is between, you know, kind of graph compute engines which <coughs> can run on, you know, relational database or Hadoop or whatever, versus you know, true graph databases with native graph storage model as well as graph processing. And one of the questions I had afterwards was, you know, if you can do graph pr processing on a relational data store and your data is already in a relational database, then why would you move to a graph, you know, a true graph database like Neo4j? I mean. Is that something that, that you had considered, or what's your perspective on that? What are the benefits of moving specifically to graph storage plus graph processing rather than graph processing on a relational database? 
So I can say that there's like two things. Um, one thing is uh, whatever you try to solve, try to isolate it. Mm -hmm. So putting everything within a relational database, that's stupid. Okay, so we had one very uh, clear objective, one service, and we used apply the technology that matched that service. So if that's relational database or uh, if graph database or whatever, that doesn't matter. You have to find the technology that actually suits your purpose. So that's important. So I mean, we use graph database and that's good for this special service, but for other services, we just rely on relational database because they will be best for other services. So we have, a, we have to evaluate what kind of query, what kind of uh, we want to do. And the other part being, that I didn't say about the graph database, because that's important. Uh, our previous um, uh, store procedure, which did a resource calculation, that was uh, 1,500 lines of SQL, okay? Uh, and now we do the same logic we, is represented uh, within uh, one class, like, yeah, some tens of lines to represent the same, because the kind of query we express with doing a traversal, it's very simple to do within the language of a graph database. And it's much more complex to express within a relational database. So that's a huge benefit, simplicity. Okay, another question over here. Um, so you said that we have a relational database and then you restream the data from the database to the graph database and then you do analysis of the graph database. Yeah, like yeah, we do the queries yes, uh, right to So uh, just cut short, I mean, uh, our system is now eventually consistent, so that's important, uh, because we don't have transaction between relational database and graph database. Uh, so we have to accept that and handle that if that's a problem. The other part being that uh, you need to be able to store within the graph database, because if the server goes down, something ends up again. Um, the, the, the initial population takes hours, okay? So if we had everything within memory and it went down and we had to populate it again, that would take too long time. So we need some kind of storage. Not maybe acid, but we need storage in some way, yeah. Okay. And um, you know, obviously you talked about the current implementations, but one of the things we've seen, you know, once people start using graph database technologies and start thinking in a, in a graph way, that they immediately start to see other projects and other possibilities for those. Um, you know, where do you see the potential opportunities for within your the companies for, for further use of graph databases? I think I can see a lot. Uh, we have the network companies. So the network uh, management is one one very ripe area for that, and there's some some ex experimenting going on in that space with Neo4j, and the, it's really a large number of nodes and large, large number of interconnection and the business rules that need to be enforced, and it is. Um, it's the kind of right thing that can be used. Uh, other area we are trying to look at is uh, we have a content management uh, problem in the company as well, and that's a new role I'm taking in the next uh, few days, which is uh, fundamentally how do you find information among so many different content stores that you have? These un unstructured uh, storage information, which is uh, the old documentum stores, and the engineering has its own custom store. Then there's a video. Then there's a uh, WebEx transcripts and on and on and on. Now, uh, there's, a, there's a really wealth of in information out there, but it is not easy to find it. Is there an uh, option to use something in a combination of uh, graph database and potentially Hadoop kind of a um, processing to, to make their life easier so the search engines can do a better job? One, one, one question we keep getting is, Google does such a great search, uh, how come your internal search uh, is, is lousy? And there's a problem with, uh, with every large company because what Google is able to do with the kind of uh, feedback it can get on its um, 
algorithms, we can't do that. Unless you have the metadata that can characterize the content that you are trying to index. So there's a, there's a big ripe area that we see for this kind of work. Um, no, not, not specifically about the case I was talking about previously, but uh, we are discussing a lot uh, within our technology architect community and because people come from different projects and they have seen different uh, problem situations and there is, there is a white space where this, where this can go forward. So we, had, we see especially problems around uh, CIM uh, when, they, when they get a little bit more complicated. They are very graphy in nature and, and hard to deal with. We, uh, we analyzed a few cases in, in, in financial services where you have very complex uh, dependencies between products and risk classifications and, and stuff like that. So there are quite a few problems out there that lend very, very well to the, to the graphical model and it, it adds value if you do it like that. It's like I, I thought the previous uh, dis discussion about replacing a system completely by a new one, you only do that if that adds value of some kind. And I mean, that's, that's the important thing really about it. So the new system needs to answer questions you couldn't answer previously, or you could only answer in an unsatisfactory way. Like 20 minutes is not satisfactory. It's, but there is a wide range of things. Sure. Yeah, so um, I mean, I, I don't know the, I actually don't know other areas within our company who could, where we could benefit from using a graph uh, database. But since we are a teleco company, I would be amazed if there weren't other areas where we could use it. So um, what I see is a problem that at least in our organization, being that the people knowing about the business problems don't know about the technology that might help them. So when I try to talk about graph databases within our company, people, they just stare at me and what, what are you talking about? They haven't heard about it. If I try to say NoSQL, it's like, what, what's that? So there's a, uh, especially my, I mean, um, um, amongst the people who, uh, who may make the decisions, like uh, architects or other uh, people who actually are able to say that we're going to new, the people who decide if you're going to use new technology, they don't know enough about the technologies that's out there. And they're just used to doing stuff the usual way, using a relational database and everything. And that's the hugest problem. We have to uh, try to get more competence within our organization at least in order to take use of all these uh, new, um, new technologies when they are applicable and will solve a business problem. I can give you the uh, answer from the Cisco perspective. So one thing that um, that happens in the infrastructure folks who kind of uh, who deploy the solutions is that uh, from Oracle they're used to lots of tools and dashboards and what have you for the d database health and uh, keeping it um, up, up and all the stats that comes. Uh, new needs uh, few, uh, few few things to be added. New is much simpler, but it doesn't mean that it, 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 will, it can escape that whole piece of uh, how to operate the system. Right? And right now, I think there's a JMX interface, but you need a good JMX uh, receiver where you can tie all the uh, things that uh, New throws, throws at you uh, when it's operating. And um, we did not find in our um, IT um, a good JMX uh, console for whatever historic reason. So, th so that's one area. Um, 
I think the b bigger question that I think uh, that uh, that is about um, SQL versus why why new at all. There's a there's a lot of um, uh, the past experience people have with SQL, which is good. So it's not to replace SQL, but to kind of educate what is the right solution for a right problem. That, that's the key thing. You, you're, you're not trying to replace SQL <coughs> with uh, um, no SQL. You're trying to get, get the right problem. So that education is uh, is a is a, is a thing that needs to happen. The size of the problem, the the connectivity of the problem. I think the three things that were heard this morning. Uh, Eric's lecture was on the there was the, on the modeling, and there was one thing that he mentioned uh, that stuck with me was. Uh, when you're modeling, don't throw in extra stuff into it. Model for what the problem you're solving. I think that's where new fits in well, and even even a SQL will fit in well. It's, it's just that, that that's a style of solving a problem in a most uh, elegant way. And the second is the total size. Uh, how fast will your data grow such that your performance doesn't degrade over the life expected life of the application? Okay. Dominic, Sebastian, you got any? Any key things you'd be looking for in terms of the future no, development? I, I, see it, I see it quite similarly, but uh, an, an important point to make is there is industry take up. So uh, the product itself must be kind of good, C quite simply. But I'm completely with Pram that um, we still see that a lot of things on this enterprise ready checklist are still missing. That, that goes from user rights management, it goes very much into the operations area. So there, there needs to be like this ecosystem uh, readiness that, that, that still needs to be completed. And also with the monitoring, for example, that is a prime example. You won't get for the big monitoring systems from BMC and so on, you, you don't have a Neo4j plugin. It, it just does, didn't exist. So. Uh, we, in, in our case, invested a lot of time into, into building our own adapters to the, to the JMX endpoint. So we exported the JMX in a format that uh, these, the monitoring system from HP could read so that the operations people were even able to, to, to drive the system. So the system is, is fine. We know the limitations. Right now, we know it, won't, it, it is not scaling. Uh, horizontally, but I mean, most data sizes I have seen fit nicely on a machine. Big data is, of course, a big hype, uh, or a big topic, but not everyone has big data. Sure, sure. I think one quick question here, we can answer that quickly, and then that's all we've got time for, I'm afraid. But So yeah, that, that's, it's, it's a, that's a complex reasoning about. Uh, yeah, the question was about um, obviously they're all using Neo4j probably graph and whether they had considered uh, RDF semantic graph technology uh, for that, which is that's uh, that's opening up a whole new uh, panel, I think. But <laughs> yeah. briefly, yes, yeah, yes or no, and if not, why not? Yes, because we have enough people that, that uh, did a PhD and believe in the semantic web and, and all those topics. But in the end, uh, you should deliver a system that is as simple as possible. And uh, frankly, nodes and relationships with an attached hash map bring you pretty far. So it was sufficient in our case. We don't have a hypergraph. We, we just don't. Any other comments on there? Or, or yeah, we just, uh, <coughs> we just, I meant, tried to evaluate the market and went for neo for j So that's the way we did it. Prototyped, did it work? Well, yes. So we went for it. As simple as that. Okay. Right. Well, we're already, I think, over time, and uh, I'll let you get on to the next break. But please join me in thanking the, the panelists. <laughs>